Hello, pup parents, and welcome to today's episode of the Perfect Pup Podcast. My name is Devin. This episode, it's a little bit sad, but it's also one that we need to talk about, and that's the fact that there are over a million dogs per year that are relinquished to shelters. So not that just end up in shelters, but are given up by pup parents for a variety of reasons. We're going to talk about what those reasons are, what we can do to reduce the statistic and a few other creative ideas then and things that we just need to understand about these statistics and how we can personally and as a community help decrease those numbers. So let's get right into it. Roughly 3 million dogs per year end up in shelters. And while there isn't a perfect statistic out there as to how many are relinquished, there are a few data points I was able to piece together that show roughly a million are relinquished by the pup parent to a shelter willingly, whether that be because the dog needs to be euthanized, or other reasons that we'll talk about more, but that's about 2,700 dogs per day. So on average, you know, almost 3,000 people per day are having to make the terribly challenging decision to relinquish their dogs. And I don't want to minimize how painful that experience can be for people. I have not personally experienced it, but I know people who have, and I've read stories and I've seen different threads online and talked to people who have had to make the very tough choice of relinquishing their dog. And I don't want to minimize that. I cannot even fathom how hard that would be. And I do think as well that we need to, as a community of pup parents, be a little bit better about not having a stigma against people who do feel that they need to uh, relinquish their dog. Of course, I think we should all try to do certain things like we're going to talk about in this episode to keep our dogs in our homes, but every situation is unique. And if you've had to go through that experience of relinquishing your dog, my heart goes out to you. I am certain that was extremely, extremely challenging. And many of these statistics that we're going to cite, a lot of the reasons for relinquishment had to do with moving or a landlord wouldn't let them have a pet, you know, reasons that are sometimes completely out of your control. And again, it doesn't make it easier. It's so, so challenging. So I'm going to reference two studies that have their limitations, just like any study does. But the first study was done about 25 years ago. And a, a group of shelters across the United States, so they tried to get different geographical and socioeconomic regions, and, and you know they tried to have a variety. But basically, when people were coming and presenting their dogs for relinquishment, they asked them to take a survey, and it had many questions. Some of them had to do with you know demographics of the human, you know age, um, ethnicity, income level, those types of things. But then it also had to do with uh, information about the dogs, how old the dog was where they got the dog originally, whether it was from a shelter or a breeder or a friend, those types of things, age of dog, uh, breed, all that good stuff. Study number two was slightly different and in my opinion, a little less effective, but it did a phone interview with anyone who had said they had relinquished a dog within the past five years. So that in itself provides its limitations because I can barely remember what I did last week and how I felt last week, let alone something that happened three to five years ago. So These studies do have their limitations, but I think generally you will see that the information that is provided by these studies is consistent with what you would believe. So let's dive into them and know that these are a good framework for how we're approaching this. One of the most interesting statistics found in these studies was they asked people who were relinquishing due to problematic behaviors or challenging behaviors, they asked them to cite the top reasons Uh, why they felt like they couldn't handle their dog's behavior. And number one, by quite a long shot, was hyperactivity. Number two um, was barking or excessive noise. You know, you think about it, and those two things, yeah, they're general, and they can encompass a lot of other things. But, you know, a dog that's seemingly always having energy and a dog that's making a lot of noise, those things can be challenging and frustrating. So when we talk about hyperactivity, you know, it's important to recognize that dogs are dogs they have more energy than typically we do, especially a puppy or a younger dog. They are learning, they're exploring, they're growing, and they are going to have a lot of energy. So part of this generally with how we look at, you know, the dogs that end up in shelters and and the amount of 
relinquishment that is happening is I think before even training or even, you know, the things we're going to talk about, it's having a proper expectation of what a dog is like. Of course, if you already have your dog now and you're feeling overwhelmed, that's okay. We're going to talk about some things to, to reduce hyperactivity. So some of the top things that you can do, and I'm not going to dive too far into this because we have tons of episodes about, you know, reducing problem behaviors, working on impulse control, you know, dealing with hyper dogs. So first things first, your dog needs proper exercise. Dogs need physical exercise. And I'm not going to say walks because I think thinking, oh, I took my dog on a 15, 20 minute walk. That's enough exercise. Truthfully, it's probably not enough. And it's a little bit of a trap to think about exercise just as walks. So making sure your dog has physical exercise, including walks, but also, you know, fetch, tug, uh, using a flirt pole, you know, them playing with other dogs, really getting their energy out. The other thing is mental enrichment or mental exercise. That's things like snuffle mats or lick mats or foraging boxes or puzzle toys. And a big part of that is maximizing mealtime. You feed your dog two, three, four times a day, depending on their age. That is an opportunity to provide enrichment for them. Instead of just putting their food in a bowl, try putting some of it in a Kong or in a snuffle mat or in a puzzle feeder or, you know, even just spreading some of it out on the ground and they have to forage and find it with their nose. Those little things, they make a huge difference. And of course, working on impulse control. We have 21 impulse control games as part of Pupford Academy Plus. It is a great course that is going to take impulse control, which can feel daunting and overwhelming and help you play games that are going to make it fun for you and for your dog and work on things like bursting through doors, barking at the door, not waiting for their food, all those challenging things. A couple other stats that came out in these in these studies and really kind of where I want to focus on is 96% of people surveyed in that first survey said that their dog had not received any formal obedience training. And they classified formal as, you know, an in-person trainer or going to an in-person obedience class, something that is, you know, more structured. 96% of those dogs that were relinquished did not have formal training. And even beyond that, even outside of the more formal side of training, 28% of pup parents said they did not do any training at all. And truthfully, as sad as it makes me, it's not surprising. Those dogs did not stand a chance. If you don't do training with your dog, you will become overwhelmed with their behavior and how they act. Dogs are not wired to behave how we envision them and want them to behave. Sometimes it's the exact opposite. You know, our dogs see a door open, that's a place to explore. You don't want them going through the door, but their innate desires, their literally hardwiring in their brain is telling them to go out their door. Or if a squirrel runs by, they have hardwiring in their brain. They have prey drive. They want to chase it. Do you want them to chase it? Probably not. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to because it's hardwired into their brain. And that's what I mean when I say some of these dogs that were relinquished and are getting relinquished to shelters, they never stood a chance because if training does not happen, we're gonna become overwhelmed and there are gonna be things that are problematic and lead us to feel like we need to, or we can't handle our dogs. And again, I'm not downplaying the challenge of raising a dog. It is frustrating, it is difficult, and sometimes you feel like what you're doing is not working. I've been there, I've shed the tears, I've been frustrated, I've yelled into my pillow, all that stuff because of my puppies and dogs behaviors. I promise you I know how hard it is, But when we make a commitment of getting a dog and bringing them into our home, we are making a commitment to raise them and train them to be well-behaved dogs that can handle their environment around them. So it is on us and it's not easy, but that is a huge reason why we here at Pupford launched and are continuing to launch free online dog training courses. I promise, I know that this might sound like a sales pitch and I get it. We are a company. We are trying to make a profit. We are trying to sell products. Of course we are, but we truly deeply care as a company. And the reason, a big reason this company was started originally 
was we saw that statistic of 96% of dogs relinquished to shelters had received zero formal training. And we know that there is a need for people and they have a desire to train, but they don't know where to start. And sometimes you end up on a hundred different websites and you're on a bunch of YouTube channels and that's fine and you can try and piece it together. But what 30 Day Perfect Pup does and why we created it this way is it puts it into an easily consumable package that you can go through, track your dog's progress, see what days you're on and go back and reference. You have a, you have videos, you have text recaps, there's an ebook, there's so many opportunities to do this. And what was interesting as well, in one of these other studies, they, you know, asked Ask some of these pup parents, you know, what factors may have led you to not relinquish your dog? Like what could, what maybe could have you done to, or could have been different that would have led you to keep your dog in your home? And about 34% that said having access to free or low cost training programs could have helped reduce relinquishment. And that truly at the core of why we here at Pupford and me individually love what I do and care about, you know, the work that I do and these podcasts and the articles and the videos and all the different things we do here at Pupford. We want to help reduce that statistic because it's so important to train our dogs and people need access to high quality training, which 30 Day Perfect Pup is, and they need it for free. And that's why we have created these free courses. We also have the new dog starter course. We have an impulse course that's free uh, with Kevin that we we created. Like we have resources because we want people to build strong relationships with their dogs. The other point that came out in these studies of one of the highest factors to reducing relinquishment. Number one was training. That was what needed to be done. It's it's. It's non-negotiable. We must train our dogs. And the second was proper vet care. Our dogs, they're unique. They have unique health concerns. And staying up with the routine vet visits is so, so important because as our if our dogs have health problems, sometimes those financial burdens stack up. And that leads us, again, to feel like we may need to relinquish our dogs. So on that note, too, I highly recommend just individually from my own experience um, looking at pet insurance because sometimes that 10, 20 bucks a month or whatever it might be for your specific dog or household put towards pet insurance can really save you money in the long run. And let's face it, dogs can be expensive. Dogs, uh, they have a lot of things that they need and vet care, especially when you have emergencies or you know medical things that pop up that you're not expecting, they can really add up. So all of this to say, that there are hundreds of thousands, literally millions of dogs ending up in shelters every single year. And while it can feel daunting and it can feel like there's nothing we can do, there are some things that can be done individually and as a community. And above all, it's training your dog. It's putting the time and effort in. And I want to say this, that training your dog, it's not just about behaviors. Yeah, of course, that's kind of the end result we're looking for. But when you train your dog, a couple things are going to happen. First, you are going to become better acquainted with your dog generally. Your relationship is going to improve. You're going to see how they act. You're going to see their quirks. They're going to see, you know, you'll learn their strengths and their weaknesses. And in turn, the second second thing that it will do is it is going to give you empathy for your dog and for their situation. So above all, train your dog. It's so, so important and it's going to help you. It's going to help them feel more confident and you are going to be a happier pup parent. And hopefully as we all strive to do this, we are going to keep dogs in homes. At the core of what we're doing here at Pupford is we are trying to reduce the number of dogs that end up in shelters and we want to help you as a pup parent raise happy, healthy, and well-mannered pups. And we know that starts with training and nutrition is a part of that and companionship is vital. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're thinking, hey, my dog's pretty well behaved or I'm on the right track, you can still help by sharing 30 Day Perfect Pup. I know, yes, we're a company. Of course, we try and sell products as part of 30 Day Perfect Pup. But at its core, you know, people don't have to buy products to use 30 Day Perfect Pup. I'm saying that as someone who helps with the marketing at Pupford, I've worked with this company for almost five years. 
you don't have to buy products to use 30 Day Perfect Pup. It is a 100% free resource. You don't have to put a credit card in. So if you know people, if you have friends, families, neighbors who are struggling with their dog's behavior, share 30 Day Perfect Pup with them. And it may just save that family situation and it may help them keep their dog out of a shelter. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts if that's where you're listening. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, leave me a comment. I love seeing reviews, especially with feedback. I take it all very seriously. But other than that, we will catch you on the next episode.